Internet in New Jersey in the 60s. So he would do things like become the head of the cultural arts program and show Kenneth Anger movies. You know, he'd show these experimental game movies like Scorpio Rising and think that this was how he was going to do his coming out. And to some degree it worked. Then in 1968, he, uh, which was his senior year, he decided to invite a very distinguished speaker to campus. And this speaker, as I have here, Beginnings of Activism, was Dick Leitch. Now, Dick Leitch was the president of the Mattachine Society of New York, which, for those of you who don't realize, Mattachine was the first major gay rights organization in the United States, which had started in California, in Los Angeles, in 1950 by Harry Hay. By the late 50s into the early 60s, Mattachine had a branch here in New York, and Dick Leitch, by the mid-60s, had become the president. Dick Leitch, at that point, was making the rounds to colleges and universities around the Northeast in particular, talking about the experience of being gay. And you have to realize, this was before Stonewall. Stonewall happened in 1969, so gay liberation hadn't officially really kicked off yet. Dick Leitch was doing these lectures at colleges around the area, and Vito decided he wanted to get Leitch out to talk to Fairleigh Dickinson. So he brought him out in the spring of his senior year and was thrilled to have him there and gave him this wonderfully respectful and decorous introduction of this New York City speaker coming to talk to us about the homosexual experience. And Dick Leitch got up to the podium and said, you can forget everything he just said. I'm just a good old fashioned cocksucker. <laughs> Which, the audience did not do what you just did. <laughs> you think that that's funny and that's great. The audience in Fairleigh Dickinson in 1968 was absolutely horrified by this. Um, you know, FDU is a suburban New Jersey campus. That kind of language was absolutely not heard on that kind of campus at that time. And Vito was very uncomfortable with that, that people were so rattled by one word. And after the talk was over, uh, one of Vito's professors came up to him, a political science professor whom he liked a lot, came up to him and said, someday, Cookie, they'll shoot you in the streets if you push this thing. And that made Vito furious. He realized that Dick Leitch's choice of vocabulary was certainly off color and was probably inappropriate for the setting, but he also realized that it was an expression of gay pride. And for a professor to come up to Vito afterward and say that this was inappropriate and you're gonna get yourself in danger because of this, this infuriated Vito. And he realized at that point that he had had enough of New Jersey and he wanted to get to a place where nobody would be shocked by this kind of language or this kind of outness of sexuality. So as soon as he possibly could, he moved to Greenwich Village in about 1968. Now, when Vito moved to the village after he graduated, he did not get involved immediately in gay politics because there was very little of gay politics to get involved in. Stonewall happened in June of 69, which was the following year, it was a full year after Vito finished college. And for that year before Stonewall, Vito immersed himself in gay culture in the village, but that was kind of like a bar culture or a gay restaurant culture. He became a waiter at a restaurant called Mama's Chicken Room, which was later called the Gay Hangout of the World. It was down on Charles Street in the village. And Vito very much enjoyed gay socializing and loved this new circle of friends he was meeting, but it wasn't a political scene. And then when Stonewall happened on June 28, 1969, this, even at the very beginning, was not something that Vito was ready to face. He actually was at Stonewall. He had attended Judy Garland's funeral, which as many of you know was that very afternoon. He was up at Frank Campbell's funeral home on Madison and 81st. Vito was an enormous Judy Garland fan, which is probably not a shock to many of you. He went to the funeral. He went downtown when it was over. He had to go to a shift at the Omnibus restaurant where he was working. And when the shift was ending, his boss at McDonald's said to him, um, listen, I hear that there's something going on at the Stonewall. Uh, there are a bunch of crazy queens who are fighting back against the cops. Don't go there. It's trouble. It's bloodshed. These are people who are going to bring nothing but problems to us. Vito being Vito needed no more invitation than someone telling him don't do this to like run to Sheridan Square and see what was going on. He ran to Sheridan Square and what he saw was unprecedented. There was a raid going on at the bar, which was totally typical. Cops were always raiding the gay bars and dragging the patrons out and marching them into paddy wagons and people's names were being put in newspapers the following day and people would lose their jobs. It was a big disaster. This was totally typical. 
In fact, at the Stonewall, four days before, there had been another raid. This time, because who knows why, the summer heat, or Judy Garland's death, or the fact that we just had enough of this crap, the patrons were not just allowing themselves to be marched out and taken off to jail. They were starting to fight back. And Vito saw this almost from the very beginning. But unlike the Vito that we know from gay lore, Vito, when he saw this going on, was really terrified. Vito was someone who his whole life was very afraid of violence. And he saw at the beginnings of Stonewall people starting to throw pebbles at the cops and then throw bigger rocks and then throw change and throw bottle caps and throw bottles. And eventually they had backed the cops into the Stonewall and were throwing Molotov cocktails through the window and using a parking meter batter ram to try to break down the door and get in. This fascinated Vito, but it was a little bit much for him. It was a little too violent and too scary. So he watched this action. He climbed, he, he crossed Christopher Park, found an elm tree, and climbed up it, and watched the action from a branch. And he thought that this was fascinating, but he wasn't really ready to join the movement yet. What finally brought Vito into the gay movement was this raid on a bar called the Snake Pit the following March, March 8th, 1970. And I'd like to read to you from my book about this, and it gives you some sense of how Vito got involved in gay rights. Excuse me. On the night of Sunday, March 8th, 1970, the Empire State Building stood out in a clear winter sky as Vito trudged north, his feet aching from a long shift of the omnibus. Hunching his shoulders against the cold, he kept his eyes fixed on Empire State's soaring antenna and counted the long blocks remaining between him and home. At West 11th Street, his attention was pulled back to the pavement. Directly across from St. Vincent's Hospital, he spotted hundreds of obviously gay, candle-bearing individuals listening to a pastor's somber prayer for the recovery of Diego Venales, a young Argentine who lay upstairs in a coma. Vito approached the vigil. A wiry, dark-haired young man thrust into his hand a leaflet, which read, Snake Pit raided, 167 arrested. One boy near death at St. Vincent's either fell or jumped out precinct window, landed and was impaled on a metal fence. Any way you look at it, that boy was pushed. We are all being pushed. Fighting gays and any of you who call yourselves human beings with guts to stand up to this horror, gather at Sheridan Square tonight at 9 o'clock to march in the 6th Precinct. Stop the raids. Defend your rights. There will be a death watch vigil at St. Vincent's immediately after the protest. Vito glanced up at the hospital. He knew the snake pit all right. It was a dank West 10th Street basement bar so nondescript that some area residents didn't even know it existed. Mr. Leaflet introduced himself as Marty Robinson, a Brooklyn carpenter and member of the newly formed Gay Activists Alliance. He filled Vito in on the reason for the vigil. Early that morning, Inspector Seymour Pine, who had led the Stonewall raids the previous summer, burst into the snake pit, where he found almost 200 men in an area built for a crowd less than half that size. Pine's pretext for the raid was the bar's illegal status, as well as its disregard of city fire codes. When customers became belligerent, Pine envisioned another Stonewall. This time, he wouldn't let matters escalate. He arrested everyone at the bar and hauled them over to the 6th Precinct on Charles Street. Among those arrested, Diego Vinales had special reason to be afraid. He was living on an expired tourist visa in East Orange, New Jersey, and feared deportation. At the precinct, according to one of the other prisoners, quote, nobody told us about our rights or why we were being arrested. When this man inquired about his rights, he was ordered by a cop, shut your fucking mouth. Another officer called him a faggot and a prick. In this environment, Vinales panicked, bolted up the steps, tried to leap from a second-story window to an adjacent rooftop. He missed his target and plunged to street level, where six 14-inch railing spikes gored his groin and thigh. Unable to free him, fire department rescuers were forced to blow towards the fence and transport the victim, still impaled, to St. Vincent's. Chilled, Vito returned his gaze to the pamphlet in his hand. What it said was true. Diego Vinales had indeed been pushed from that window. He was pushed by society. Vito realized that if Vinales didn't have to be so scared of being deported, he wouldn't have jumped. And if he hadn't been patronizing a gay bar, he would not have been arrested, just like the crowd at the Stonewall last summer. These were not isolated, these were not isolated injustices. Gay people were perpetual targets of the law. 
This is what really galvanized Vito and made him realize that it wasn't enough to be living in Greenwich Village and working at a gay bar and restaurant and having fun with his friends. He needed to join the beginning of the movement. And the beginning of the movement was most vitally displayed through Gay Activists Alliance. Gay Activists Alliance, like Gay Liberation Front, was an organization that was developed immediately after Stonewall in response to injustice that gay people were facing on a daily basis. Gay Activists Alliance was particularly concerned with changing the laws and um, changing, for example, laws that said that it was perfectly legal in New York City to fire someone simply because they were gay, or was perfectly, perfectly legal and acceptable to throw someone out of his or her apartment simply because they were gay. These were laws that GAA set about to change, and this was the first time that this was really happening in an organized way in New York City, and Vito loved this. GA was a very loud, in-your-face, in-the-streets kind of organization that was constantly going on demonstrations that it called ZAPs, where it would target homophobic politicians who were enforcing these laws and try to embarrass the hell out of them, screaming in their offices, screaming in front of their, their apartment buildings, and trying to basically embarrass them out of their bigotry. Now, this was exactly Vito's kind of action once he got involved in GA, but he also realized that most people in New York City were not ready for this. In 1970, to be going out in the streets screaming about your sexuality was a very scary thing. And he thought that it might be more effective to bring people into the movement through entertainment. So while he was at GAA, he devised two programs, one of which he called the Cabaret Night and one of which he called the Film Night. 